there we go. And share and oops. sorry. Why is it not? Okay, there we go. Pardon for the delay. Go ahead, Paul. Uh, okay, thanks, Mark. So I'm speaking for the first uh, three slides. Um, so we have this uh, project that Mark and I have been pursuing, um, uh, revising, uh, updating the, the uh, reconstruction of the EDIC. And um, we've recently submitted a, a paper uh, for publication on um, our uh, classification results. Just go to the next slide, Mark. So um, historically, there is no um, uh, agreed or, or uh, clearly defended uh, classification uh, of the Vietic languages uh, in the literature. Um, there are various classifications, but you just can't in interrogate them and 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 come to something uh, come to some sensible assessment um and this is um uh, this is very unsatisfactory so we decided to to sit down and come up with a comparable and representative uh, data set and see if we could um, attack this problem head on mark you have to keep yep yep so uh again we like the the previous paper uh we started off with a, a computational approach and then um we went about seeing if we could uh, confirm or augment the results with historical, phonological, etymological, typological, and uh, historical evidence. Um, uh, and uh, we used the, the splits tree um, software, not traditional Lexico statistics. Mark? Yep. So, being as quick as I can on this one, so you can see that the um, the Vietic languages uh, are spoken in Vietnam, and this is a, an area that was colonized by the uh, the French in the 19th century, and um, and and yet uh, very little um, uh, was known about the diversity within the family. Um, Vietnamese has been quite well known for several hundred years. Um, uh, the the Muang languages were also uh, known quite uh, well early on. Um, that is, people knew of them, but they tended to regard them as uh, just sort of, you know, uh, dialects of, or, you know, unimportant, unimportant uh, languages. Um, and even though the EFEO had a program of, of field work in the early part of the 20th century, and quite a bit of data was collected on Vietnamese and, and Muang, um, it was not clear in the literature whether people thought that Vietic was a uh, Austroasiatic group. Um, in fact, a, a few French like Maspero defended the view that it was somehow um, mixed or had a Thai or Chinese uh, base or, or major stratum. Uh, and the picture was very confused. Um, however, uh, by the 1960s, um, it, it became increasingly clear and widely agreed that we were looking at a essentially a restructured tonal Austroasiatic uh, language. Next slide. And then in the 60s, um, uh, comparative linguistics really took off in Austroasiatic. And uh, through the 60s, 70s, um, there was quite a bit of effort, um, particularly focusing on uh, tonal and uh, onset correspondences in the group. And this was mainly because of the interest in tones and trying to validate the theory of tonogenesis. Um, and then in the 70s through to the 90s, uh, we saw the incorporation of a substantial amount of minor Vietic um, data, because there are maybe 20 languages um, up in the hills, very small, small populations, and they're often very conservative linguistically and very important for the uh, fleshing out the reconstruction. And uh, particularly Michel Filous has, has been refining and, and publishing uh, the reconstruction. And so that uh, by the present day, uh, mainly thanks to Filous's efforts, we have uh, a fairly well-developed reconstruction with about 1,200 uh, proto-Vietic uh, lexical items. Next slide. Okay, so um, 
moving on from the reconstructions uh, based on the data that had been as assembled, uh, uh, over the last 40 years, there have been about a dozen key publications that have provided some kind of uh, phylogenetic uh, hypothesis of, of uh, Vietic, sometimes called Viet Mung, but of course we're referring to the entire group Vietic and Viet Mung is, is one branch. And uh, we see multiple approaches in these uh, various publications with typological, uh, typological criterion being the most frequently noted one. And there is a general division between uh, uh, essentially monosyllabic word uh, languages with the complex tone systems and those which have a more Austroasiatic typology with um, a presyllable, sesquisyllable uh, types um, and either no tone systems or um, uh, let's call them more basic tone systems, uh, generally involving some kind of phonation, sometimes just a four-way uh, phonation system. Um, then geograph geography is also noted, kind of a sort, southern versus northern typology, which overlaps uh, uh, with the northern and region areas, uh, northern and southern areas, rather, um, in northern Vietnam. And lexically, there have been, of course, you know, lexico-statistical studies, which, which indicate degrees of closeness, but those are just raw numbers, and they do not really uh, uh, give us a hierarchical understanding of uh, the relationships between among the Vietic languages. Uh, other lexical data, uh, Chamberlain in particular did provide a phylogenetic tree based strictly on fauna terms. However, he does not explain how he arrives at the tree. And so it's not testable, we can't verify it. And it's again, it's listed, limited to fauna terms as opposed to other kinds of vocabulary. Um, it, it's, it's an approach, but uh, it's not, it's not, uh, we're not sure about how it's been applied. Surprisingly, there's been very little done with the phonological side, very little utilized. And perhaps one exception was um, Hayes noting the dis distinction between those languages which had final H and which lacked final H. And that also happens to correspond to tonal categories because the H uh, uh, fricative uh, resulted in a tonal category. So that, that is one category and we'll, we'll expand on that later. The patterns of groupings in the previous classifications have been uh, highly consistent in noting Viet Mung as a group, including Muen, uh, but uh, where Muen is uh, within the Viet Mung group is, has been a question. Uh, Bang Kui is frequently noted as a group, but not consistently. Sometimes it's separate, sometimes grouped together. So the status has been uncertain based on these previous uh, studies. And then the archaic Vietic languages. Uh, um, the ones with presyllables and, and either simple or uh, basic uh, or no tone systems. There's no consistency in the proposed branchings, and so there's really not much you can say. So these diverse approaches and very incomparable data sets used by different researchers have led to divergent results, no surprise, and claims, uh, and they're difficult to assess. So we need to start from scratch uh, with uh, as much data as we can and to make our, our uh, methods and principles transparent, and hopefully that's what we will accomplish. Uh, so the lexical data uh, includes 29 Vietic doculects uh, and 116 lexical items, something like what Paul showed for Nico Beres. And so here are the 29 lex that we have been able to assemble from various sources, various uh, researchers. And to my knowledge, this is the largest assessment, uh, sorry, uh, assembling of these kinds of lex into the study. I think the closest was uh, by Peros, but uh, this is more than, than I think anyone has done. So we are applying new methods and a large, very large uh, set of um, uh, lects, uh, 116 to make the statistics uh, manageable. When it gets too large, it gets uh, unwieldy. So in the database, we identified those which were cognates among these different uh, 29 lects. Uh, and we identified etima such as Austroasiatic, or if they were loan words from Old or Middle Chinese, Sai and Chamic. And then we applied split tree software uh, with this Bayesian style algorithm. Again, it's not lexico statistics. It runs through all of the possible trees to, uh, based on the lexical relatedness to identify the optimal uh, uh, phylogenetic tree. So this, and this is something that's applied in genetics and other areas of study. And so we're just using those kinds of things. 
no problem. Um, and so we have a neighbor net mapping and a phylogram showing a primary uh, branch structure. And uh, oops, uh, oops, next one. Uh, the neighbor net is the first type. Now you can see here, this is not a hierarchical uh, phylogenetic tree. It instead shows degrees of, of relatedness. And so we see no surprise. Uh, Viet Vietnamese here with Nguyen and Mung. Uh, it actually shows Nguyen as being closer to, to Vietnamese, which is a, a question for careful study of Viet Mung, but that's that's for another study. And then Gui and uh, Gui Ta and the uh, Bong Thum groups here. And notice how these are on the right side in opposition to the so-called archaic conservative lects here with the Chut group here and RM uh, 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 somewhat connected to this. The status of RM has been uh, somewhat uh, debated. In fact, we will see some discussion at our conference about RM. It will be interesting to see. Uh, but uh, so that's what we get out of this uh, neighbor net. It is not yet a phylogenetic uh, tree, but it does show this. These are groupings. That's what consistently we see these kinds of groups. That's helpful. That's helpful information. But now Paul will talk about the tree. Thanks. So this is a UPGMA uh, tree, um, and you can see that uh, oh, it's, it's, it, we have Kamul and Jahay as outgroups um, to root the tree. And it, it's a little dense, but you can see that there's a primary branching. Um, just at the bottom, you can see the group with Maling, Malang, Kree, Maling, etc. We're calling that the uh, the uh, Tavung Maliang branch, and that seems to be a primary clade uh, versus the rest of the family. And those languages, there's spoken in the um, in the borderlands between uh, Vietnam and Laos and also in pockets in Laos and actually even out into Thailand. So there, that's some sort of Western movement. Um, so it's not surprising that they group and it's very interesting that they seem to form a primary group. Uh, at the top of the tree, you can see that Viet Muang group, um, that's uncontroversial. But notice how we have regular nested branching uh, in this phylogram. So the Kui To just above Viet Muang, then the Pong Tum just above that group, and then the Mai Juk Sak, or what the Vietnamese call the Chut group, uh, just above that. So this, this regular nested branching. Uh, and then a Rem, which seems to sit on its own. But um, we made a very careful study of the, the lexicon. RM is a very small population, has very low number of cognates with anybody, but it does have, um, I think it's uh, five or six uh, unique lexical innovations shared with the rest of that Chut group. And phonologically, it's very, very close to that Chut group. So we think it's actually a, a, a divergent Chut language and actually uh, so we would actually argue that it, it properly belongs with May, Zhuk and Suck um, in the tree. And so there we have actually uh, a very clear tree structure with two primary branchings. Um, I like to call them east and west. Mark doesn't like that term. Um, and uh, in the what I would call the, the eastern group, we have this very neat um, uh, nested step down. Okay, next slide. Now we can correlate this with phonological evidence. Um, coda developments um, seem to be the best uh, correlate of the nested branching um, that we can see. Uh, uh, you have to take my word for it in this short presentation, but the vowel correspondences and syllable onsets uh, really do prove useless when it comes to any Vietic classification, uh, every group seems to retain uh, archaic features and, and it makes it very difficult. But if we just look at the coders, um, you can see this uh, on the, in the left, the H, the final H, we see the phonologization of H into creaky tones um, in those uh, three groups uh, and the retention of H in the more conservative languages. Okay, that fits nicely with that nested branching. Uh, if we look at now at the R and L columns, L is preserved or has to be reconstructed as being preserved 
uh, in all of the subgroups, uh, it has quite diverse, uh, divergent reflexes, but we have to reconstruct L. If we look at the R column, we see we have to reconstruct a merger with L in all of the non Tavung Maliang languages. So that correlates quite nicely with that primary split. Similarly, if we look at the S column, it's arguable, but we think that we have to reconstruct S for Tavung Maliang given the reflexes we have. Whereas in every other group, all those on the what I would call the eastern side, I think we have to reconstruct some sort of voiceless lateral to account for all the reflexes. And that fits very nicely with that primary branching. Okay, next slide. Okay, uh, so what we have so far, um, this is a, a more concise uh, tree than the, uh, the other neighbor, uh, sorry, the other uh, uh, more complex one, uh, somewhat simplified. And what we can see is that these, these lexical innovations uh, do connect our M to Chud, as mentioned. Uh, the other groups are relatively uncontroversial. Uh, but what we see it, very crucially is this corresponding typology, again, as noted, uh, but uh, this phonological restructuring and developments in the codas match up. This is very useful so that we can see the groups, for example, which have uh, lost H and they were rephonologized. So this upper group is essentially the uh, uh, tone uh, types and then non-tone types, the more conservative types. Uh, and uh, uh, the uh, retention of R in uh, the uh, Tavung Malian group and such. So this is quite, uh, uh, quite useful information. Uh, and it implies ethno-historical circumstances that these northern groups and, uh, oh, Paul was mentioning east-west. Uh, it was just that I, I, I assume a more, um, this is west, this is east, but this is north versus south. So it's, it's just that there's different groupings there. No, northern subgroups have closer social history and uh, certainly after contact with Sinitic uh, and the typological convergence. And so uh, some historical notes. Uh, on the locus of dispersal, that is an obvious question to ask about. And the center of diversity of Vietic currently is to the south, uh, but it is not clear if the lexical and phonological data say anything about the uh, locus of dispersal, the data we have if, you know, presented so far. However, if we look at early language contact, early shared di Vietic words, uh, there, it does indicate a more northerly orientation of cultural contacts for those Vietic speakers. That is, presumably, there were Vietic speakers, you know, to this northern extent, perhaps the Red River Delta. And indeed, archaeological evidence uh, has been growing. Archaeological evidence suggests continuity of culture and settlements in the Red River Delta since the late Neolithic period. And this all suggests that Vietic has had a long presence in this region, um, this broad region that we have looked at, uh, despite this current center of diversity, we may be looking at a, a larger region uh, of where Vietic has been spoken uh, uh, with more complexity perhaps in the North that has been um, somewhat reduced by convergence. And so some concluding thoughts. Uh, what we have done is an application of, uh, of this method of computational linguistics uh, to provide you know, some very useful indications, but we still need to, to uh, look at it in a broader context, looking at the extra linguistic data, uh, ethnohistory and archeology span as well. That it also highlights, of course, the value of language data of endangered languages. And these small languages can uh, contain important, essential, archaic, or peripheral information that we need to be able to figure things out better. And certainly, specifically, uh, the Tavung Malian group, uh, as we noted, have some very um, uh, archaic features, and they could be key to understanding the deeper history of Vietic. And so uh, it's for those people who might be in a position to gather more data on those lects. Yes, please do study RM, but also look at those other groups, please. And so those are our thoughts, and we uh, hope that you might have some interesting questions or comments. Oops, I'll stop sharing and I will yes. 